I'm Scott L. Miller. This is my life living in Nicaragua. Today I'm going to be deep diving more into the responses from Yosef on the series we've been doing about uh, his plans about becoming an expat, uh, moving his uh, personal items down to Nicaragua and so forth. And I also want to address the question of uh, how do you look up the laws that you may need to know for, in the example that came up today, property ownership and easements. How are you going to know how that works here in Nicaragua? Those are great questions and great topics to dive into. So we're going to get to those right after the bump. All right, today let's start with this question about easements or those areas along the highway or other situations that are similar where the government may control that land and you may need to hold back a part of that land uh, for the government or they may have possession of it or so forth. Of course, different countries are going to call this and add different things and react in different ways to it. So this is one of the things that, so I'm an American, I moved to Nicaragua a number of years ago and this is an area that I was very surprised by in moving to Nicaragua. We bought land, we were preparing to do some construction and we talked to our lawyer and said, so for the easements, or we didn't use that word because it's not a word used here, uh, how much land should we leave? We know that the road we're on is going to be upgraded in the sometime future, right? We don't know when. Uh, and so we don't want to build and, and make a lot of plans around a space that's going to go away, whether it's going to be a new sidewalk or part of the actual road or drainage or whatever, or maybe that area where they're going to put in uh, phone lines or, or cable or, or something like that. And, and it took a bit of talking. We had an architect and our lawyer there. We spent a bit of time talking about this and they came they're like they, they couldn't understand what we were talking about and finally we explained in the United States the government actually takes a part of the land that you own and everybody is like this and, and the outside of your property doesn't belong to you belongs to the government. You have to pay taxes on it. You have to purchase it. You can't you can't ignore it, but it's not yours. It's the government's and they just take it from you. In some cases, if they're taking a lot, if they're building a highway through your house, yeah, they're generally going to compensate you for that. I say generally because it's not a guarantee, but most of the time, most people are going to uh, find that if they have a house and they lose it, you're generally okay. But if it's not your house, if it's just some of your land that you lose access to or you can't use anymore, it's not uncommon to not get compensated at all. Even if it's not the government taking it. Private companies can do that too in the United States. And I know this firsthand. It's something I grew up with. Uncompensated private company seizure of our land and our usage thereof. Now, eventually we got some of that back, but only some of it, uh, but only after losing it for much of my childhood. So it sticks in my memory pretty well. Well, our lawyer and our architect were pretty shocked. They couldn't believe that property ownership could possibly be so poor and fungible in a place like the United States that likes to claim rule of law. But it is true, Americans are always aware that they don't really own their land. Everything is really the property of the government, especially these easement areas where it's just always theirs. They don't have to notify you. They don't have to treat it like it's yours. Nothing. You have to take care of it. It's not yours. This is just a punishment for having land in America. Here in Nicaragua, we don't have that. If you own the land, it's yours period, end of story. We don't have this middle of the road out so much, distance on the side of the road kind of garbage like they have in the United States. Now, sure, you may not be able to buy as much land because the government owns a road, but you know when you buy it that you have a line and what's on your side of the line is yours. What's on the other side of the line is your neighbor's or the government's. It's very straightforward the way that any reasonable country would be. There's no way to claim any rationality to having a part of the land that you have to own and take care of, but you don't have the rights to. That's literally insane. Like, there's no way Way to excuse that. There's no way to try to make that sound rational. That's just nuts. And it causes a lot of problems and it makes it very hard, especially for the poor and people who are in small lots. If you're a you know millionaire and you're buying really big lots and, and it's just you know this tiny sliver that's generally in question, you don't really notice. But when you're poor and you're trying to put a house on a small piece of property and you realize that you may not own enough to put a house on, and then you have all these laws that say you're not allowed to have a tiny house, life can get pretty complicated when you're just trying to survive. So uh, these kinds of things can become a big deal. Now, all of that is just to kind of give you a preface that, yeah, things like easements, generally, if you have concerns about those things, if you were truly concerned about them, you would be running to Nicaragua as fast as you can, or any rational country, right? And getting away from places like the US, where property ownership is super gray area, right? What does it even mean to own property in the United States? We're not sure, right? It's, it's a difficult thing. So, so that's a reason to come here. But an important question comes up. Where do I look up 
this law. How do I find out about easements? So first of all, there isn't going to be a law about easements because you need that in the opposite sense. You need a law to create this messed up situation or else normally, normal property uh, law would simply have the concept of what's yours is yours and what isn't yours isn't yours. You don't need special laws for basic property ownership. If you say, I bought an apple, it's now my apple, uh, we don't need to make a law that says, oh, the you know apple within one millimeter of the airspace is actually yours. And so, no, you only have to make laws about that when you're creating this messed up easement kind of system. So on one hand, the thought process isn't correct necessarily. If you're in the United States, yes, somewhere you have to be able to find a law about easements. But I actually find this surprising because in places that have easements, like the US, we also don't have written laws. I know some of you are going to say, but we do, we have laws on the books. Yes, some suggestions of laws are in the books, but it's a common law country. So the law only exists after the fact. That means at the time that you go to court, Right when someone has used an easement, is grabbing an easement, is defending an easement, only once something has happened do you then go in front of a judge, and the judge then decide what decides what the law is, and what they decide becomes the law. And you can say, well, you have to use case law. No, they have to be aware of case law. They don't have to follow case law. This is part of what makes common law common law. Someone writes laws. Those laws don't have to be followed. The entire concept of case law is situations where people, judges, followed something other than the written law. The entire idea of case law is that they either ignored the written law or created a new law simply by enforcing something that was never made by lawmakers. So the term the term common law, referring to the creation of case law, is a black and white way of saying no rule of law or lawmakers are not lawmakers, they're law suggestors. The judge is a lawmaker and the law only applies in that one specific case. The next time someone does the exact same thing, a judge has the right to look at the original written law and decide something based on that. They have the right to consider the case law. That is, whatever other judges have decided since then, they can consider those things and use them as the basis, or they can use their own judgment and make up their own situation, their own law on the spot, and future judges can reference them as case law. But they're not required to do any of those things. And there has been Supreme Court cases in the last half a decade in the United States that enforces this. And they were very clear that judges have the right to create new laws on the spot. Police can arrest people for something that is not breaking the law at the time that they did it. And once they're in court, the judge can decide that the thing in retrospect seems like they would like it to have been illegal, so it is illegal retroactively. So even though they did not commit a crime at the time, in the future sense, in the past, they then committed a crime. It's absolutely bonkers. So the idea for an American to think that you could look up laws and see what laws actually apply in other countries is actually a surprising thought process because you can't do this in America. And of course, you also have the problem that the written laws and the case law are not exactly public record. If you want access to those, there's no way to know which ones exist. You have to have researchers who do that. You have to pay for services like LexisNexis to get access to that information. And even then, it's a gray area, but it is a very expensive thing that not everyone has access to, and private companies control access to that. Now, most of those private companies will not keep it from you if you're willing to pay the big fees to get access to it, but it is quite literally limited to the rich and the very powerful to have access to the resources to look up what the law might be and probably would be and has been in the past in other situations. But that is it. No American has the right to know exactly what the law is intended to be, nor what the law will be when it comes into play. Those are not things Americans have the right to under common law. It just doesn't exist. Now, it is useful to know those things, and generally they will apply more than 99% of the time, I dare say, but they are not givens. So there's no such thing as knowing if you are legal or illegal in the United States until there is a lawsuit and a judge makes a decision and appeals are done and the final judge makes the decision. And that is it. Americans never, ever, ever are innocent. You only have not yet been proven guilty as far as every single thing in your life. You wear a white hat on a, on a Wednesday, that could be deemed illegal in the future now, the one thing that is very strict is that it must apply equally to all people in that given moment. So you can't pick and choose only, you know, people who have a certain group or, or leaning or whatever. You can't single them out and say, okay, we made a law and it only applies to them. That 
violates some federal statutes. But as far as simply saying white hats not allowed, totally could do that in retrospect. Go back and watch every YouTube video in which someone wore a white hat, track them down and arrest them sometime in the future. Are we allowed to wear them today? Yes, it's completely legal. Is it illegal in the future to have worn them in the past? Not necessarily. So that is a complexity that Americans face all the time. So I just find it very surprising when Americans are like in other countries, I expect to have a written law that I can reference and know what's going on. That is a very surprising mentality. Now, it turns out that in the case of Nicaragua and many other countries, you actually can do this, right? And they are completely shocked that you can't do this in America, but all the laws are public and you can look them up. And if you want, you can try to interpret them yourself. This is not advised. So this is one of the surprising things is getting over this immense hurdle that you're coming from a country where you don't have any of these rights or capabilities and going to a new country and saying, I'm going to be able to do this really sensible thing that I can't do in my own. First of all, that you can do that, that pretty much answers all your question. Wow, rule of law, sensible laws. I probably don't have to look up anything farther. Everything's gonna make sense after this. But when you go to do this, if you're doing this in America, very clearly, there's only one answer, and that is you have to contact a lawyer because there's so much that you can't know. You can't know all the cases. You can't know the original written law. You don't have legal access to them, and you have no way to interpret them. You haven't had the training. So even if you could read everything that was written in every case that was ever there, you can't possibly know how that's going to be applied. You still, with a lawyer, take some risks, but the risks go very, very low. But using a lawyer that you pay to have access to these privately held systems that keep American written and case law from the American public so that everyone wonders what it is, is by design and is part of the system. You must pay to have access to even basic legal knowledge as to what is and isn't illegal in the United States. In other countries, that is not generally true. That is rare, right? Canada, yes. UK, yes. Australia, of course. But most countries are not going to be like that. So Nicaragua is a sensible country. We have civil law. We have written laws and the judges follow the law. The judge is not there to decide what is illegal. They're there to decide if you broke the law as it exists, right? Which is different. Uh, so here in Nicaragua, very straightforward. But even though written laws do exist and you could pour through every law ever written, Right, a couple things. One, asking me to pour through every law ever written and provide them as access doesn't really make any sense, right? People say, where can I get, a lot of people, right? This one example just came up, but I get a lot. Either people will say, where can I get this law? Like I'm supposed to like have a reference to every law. Do the same thing in the United States. Show me every law for everything you ever want to do. You can't, why are you asking me? That doesn't make any sense. I really feel quite often like people are trying to make it seem like I can't produce the law so that I don't really know, right? Obviously, that's not how it works, and that's a pretty sad attempt at, at trying to, right? So some people do that. I don't think that's the case here, but it does happen, for sure. Other times, people produce laws and show them to me and are like, look, the law says this. I can show you the reference from Nicaragua. It's like, yes, you don't understand the language being used, and so this doesn't mean what you think it means. I've had that come up a lot, especially around tax law. People are like, it says right here you're taxable. I'm like, yes, you are taxable. You don't know what taxable means because you're not able to do activities that are taxed. If you did do them, you would be jointly in trouble, both for breaking the law and for not paying your taxes. But if you did break the law and do these things, you still need to pay your taxes. Just like organized crime in the United States, it is illegal to commit crimes, but even if you are illegally committing crimes, as opposed to legally committing crimes, you still have to pay taxes on them or it's an additional crime, right? So they have laws in the books like that here and for fringe cases that don't apply to anybody just in case, right? So there are tax situations that sound like one thing and a lot of American lawyers who have no idea what they're doing will say this or accounting firms will simply give this misinformation because it sounds good and they can just show this paper and move on. They don't have to interpret it. They're not on the hook for anything. So I get shown this a lot from people who clearly don't know what they're interpreting or are trying to spread misinformation and say, well, look, it says this. And you're like, okay, but do you not understand what that means? Because it, it certainly, to me, never says the thing that you're interpreting. I don't even know why you think it might say that, right? Like I'm, you know, I live here, so I understand that I have a little bit different context, but I'm often like, where are you getting the idea that this would tax you? I understand what it says and you can repeat it all you want, but it doesn't mean what you think. It says what it says, but nowhere does it says that you'll be taxed. That's a different interpretation that I don't know what activity you think you're going to do that could result in this. And no one ever gives me an example, right? Because there isn't one. But uh, so in this case, any case like this, where you're like, I want to know what this tax situation is. I want to know what this easement situation is. Anything where you're saying, can you show me the law? 
No one should ever want to be shown the law. That's not really sensible unless you think you're going to move to Nicaragua and study for the bar and become a Nicaraguan lawyer. If that's your plan, okay, study the laws. But if you are planning on being a business person or moving here or anything like that, same as if you're moving to the United States, there's only one rational thing to do, and that is to engage a lawyer. Because no matter how many of the laws you read, you don't know if there's a superseding law that you're not aware of. You don't know if there's a linguistic thing that you need to understand doesn't mean what you think it means. You don't know when a law has been rescinded but remains published so that people have a record of it. There's a lot of things you don't know and it makes no sense to try to interpret. In no other situation would you ever ask for just to be presented with the written law and then do your own legal legwork. That's crazy. So don't try to do that coming to Nicaragua. And if for people in the future reference, don't try to make it look like uh, we don't know how the law actually works by trying to make it look like we can't produce a written record. Because unless you can do that in the United States and show me that it works 100% of the time, then don't ask for it in other places when you know that's not how it works. Like we all know that isn't how the system works anywhere, right? It just doesn't make any sense. It wouldn't make any sense. And that's why people have lawyers, right? Is so you don't have to ask YouTubers to produce information you're not going to understand. What you want is someone who can listen to your specific situation, figure out exactly what you need, and interpret the laws in your exact situation. And there's more to it than that, right? We all know from the United States, right, just as an example, that what is written as law, what is case study as law, does not mean what's going to happen in the real world. Lots of times you can be told, look, Yes, this is what should happen. This is what is expected to happen. But in reality, if you're not white and you're driving in this town, the chances that you're going to be pulled over are much higher and the chances that you're going to potentially go to jail for something you did not do or that is not illegal for other people is real, right? whatever, whatever weird thing there is, there's a lot of, does this apply to you? How will it apply to you? What is the real world on the ground situation, right? Oh, there is a law that allows for this thing to happen. Oh, oh no, the law allows for that. Yeah, the law allows for hanging people in Texas too. I don't know, I made that up, but it probably does. But has Texas hung anyone in a hundred years? No, I don't think they have. So there's both the what law is on the books and there's what law will actually be used and might actually uphold in a court or ever come up as a suggestion. It's illegal in some of Arizona to have a donkey in a bathtub. Is anyone going to go to jail for putting a donkey in a bathtub? First of all, I hope no one puts a donkey in the bathtub, but if they do, I don't think they're actually going to be arrested for that. Not even get a citation. It's just silly, but the law is on the books. So laws on the books does not become a useful thing until someone is able to interpret it for you and say, here's how it's going to actually apply and what the chances of different things happening are. Because law is just complicated. So one, don't expect other countries to be able to do way beyond what the United States or UK or Canada can do. Yes, sometimes they can, like Nicaragua. This just happens to be a case where it's way better, but it doesn't mean it's going to be magic. And two, only ask for that information, like general information, like how do easements work? Great. I can give you general information. You want really good specifics for very specific circumstances. You need to engage a lawyer that you can trust. So that's their job, right? I cannot give you legal advice like a lawyer. Even in the United States where I grew up, I can't do that, let alone in a new country where I have zero legal training. So, but I do have a lawyer and they're really good for that, right? And it's super cheap. It's not like the US where these things are crazy expensive. Hiring a lawyer is very cheap. So that is just, that's the process, right? Have that expectation. Think about it logically. Don't treat it as uh, being a wholly different world but be aware that it is quite a bit different than you're used to. And, and here, written laws actually do make a difference, which is why they're constantly changing the written laws to tweak them, as opposed to in the US where written laws have a tendency to stay on the books for a really long time. They're very hard to get rid of because we don't really use them, so the effort to changing them is not very easy to justify. All right, with all of that, we're gonna jump back into Josef uh, Magruber, and look at some of his responses uh, to the videos because we did the video about uh, uh, do you want to bring all your stuff with you when relocating uh, from about a week ago, a little bit more. And then almost a week ago, uh, we did his deep dive follow up and I want to do some more on that. Partially, I am back from my trip to Belize and this is worth noting, he actually brings up Belize. I don't know if he's watching my videos closely enough to realize that I was in Belize when he asked these questions, but I'm just back from Belize and Guatemala and uh, this is my first video being made 
since I've been home. And uh, I did make it home, by the way, to celebrate my daughter's Sweet 16. We had a good time. We'll be going to Managua next week for some, some actual activities for her birthday. Um, but we're going to jump into Yosa's feedback and uh, go even deeper uh, into this conversation. I think there's some really good stuff here. And uh, hopefully we can help him make some uh, ex-padding decision making. As usual, I'm going to read his stuff and then interject as we go because it's just way easier and that way you guys remember as well where we are because if I read all of it, he's got a lot of feedback, we'll lose track of what's going on. Yosef says, one of my favorite cartoons was Dexter's Laboratory, about a little boy who is a humongous mad scientist laboratory that somehow his parents do not know that it exists. So either it is real or he is a very, has a very big imagination. While my laboratory is far more basic, a few multimeters, a few tools, a toolbox, and an outdated oscilloscope that my dad said would need the capacitors replaced. But some of my favorite YouTube channels have been those with similar labs, guys that take things apart and show whether they have uh, quality or safe circuits or not, people that build their own circuit boards or computers or whatever, largely for fun. Traveling like uh, light, like an adventure-seeking expat that loves to travel, is not compatible at all with that dream. Uh, now, I just want to say, every time he says this, I'm, I'm really adamant. When we talk about traveling light, we're not saying travel light. We're saying expatting light, right? He, he quite a few times brings up this, and, and sometimes he's correct. I'll try my best to, to bring in that context when we can. But he's um, uh, rightfully noting that there are many people who are expats, that's legit, who are not looking to move to a new place. They're not looking to just, you know, I mean, they kind of are, but they're looking to leave where they're at and maybe be, so digital nomads, right? Constantly moving from place to place or something similar. People who are adventure seekers, as he mentions, and so forth, who are constantly on the move and they don't have a, a home base, uh, whether they're permanently in or that they are based from. Um, however, I have pointed out before, that this is the opposite of me, right? Now, it's true, I am adventurous to some degree. I constantly love to travel, I like to go places, and I do travel very light when doing that. However, I've also said from the very beginning, I have wife, kids, dogs, businesses, and I need a stable environment. You guys see me in my office all the time. Now, we, when we first started uh, looking abroad, we knew that we would probably make a lot of mistakes and we needed to do a lot of research and that we couldn't just jump in and move to one place and likely get it very right. So we started very much with the understanding that we would move quite a bit in the hopes of narrowing down where we wanted to be and eventually finding a spot as soon as possible. But we expected it to take a number of years. We really expected it to take about five. If it hadn't been for COVID, realistically, it took us about four. Uh, but we did spend quite a bit of time, lived in a number of countries, moved around a lot, went back to a number of places, uh, and really did our research. Now, we're a little bit younger, I think, than Yosef, based on some of the things he said, just based on things he said. And, um, and in doing so, right, uh, uh, we knew that spending a few years now, because we had so many years we were going to spend in the new place, presumably, if we got it right, uh, and that, that it was a huge investment, in our lives, right? Not not financially, but but in time and effort and and passion and, and place. And so uh, we put in a lot of a lot of effort to narrow down and for us finding Nicaragua. Uh, but our goal always was to move our lives. I have a full office. I have desktops and cameras and pets and major, major investment in life. We're not looking to move again. I mean, maybe across the street, maybe down the road, that kind of stuff. Yes, we've, we've moved a few times as we've, uh, you know, in the way that we narrowed down our country, we also narrowed down our house within the country. And so this, this process for most people that I know tends to happen that way. Uh, and so what he's saying that he wants, except that he wants a single move, he wants to do it really fast, like that, I understand, he's saying that. But his end goal of finding a place where he's going to be comfortable, where he's going to enjoy the rest of his years, which may be a lot, I don't know, he doesn't seem that old, but then he says some things that maybe he is, I'm not sure. And, um, but his Dexter's Laboratory thing makes him makes me think he's a bit younger than me. And, because that's, that's after my time. Um, but, uh, we really wanted this stability. Now, we want to travel, and he doesn't, uh, presumably. It seems that way. Um, but we want to travel with this being our home base, with a full, we are here. This is where we are. We moved our lives. And so when I'm giving this advice, when I'm talking about this, I am not making a mistake in what advice I'm trying to give, right? I, I understand that it could be wrong. That's different. Of course, I could be wrong. But I'm not getting the wrong context here. I am not presenting, well, digital nomads do this, or lots of adventure seekers like that. I am talking about exactly Yosef's situation, 
what I'm talking about, or, or as close as we can. I'm, I'm interpreting his situation with the goal of moving to a single place, being completely static, uh, never moving, never traveling, uh, never wanting to be adventurous, never wanting to be a digital nomad, completely assumed, right? So he mentions quite a bit this adventure-seeking expat thing, and there are those people, and they do move around a lot, and some of the people in the comments might be those people or thinking in the terms of those people. A lot of people get caught up in whatever their context is. Um, in this case, uh, it's easy for me to keep Yosef's context because it's so incredibly similar to my own, probably just at a little bit older age. Okay, he said, even the military travels heavily, uh, bringing big tents, generators, equipment, and so on. I even had the Dexter's Laboratory PS1 video game. That's quite some time ago. Star Trek The Next Generation had the obvious solution to bringing your stuff. Either a humongous spaceship, but I found it curious how spartan that crew quarters are on Star Trek. Actually, I want to point this out because I have much the same feeling. So, I love Star Trek The Next Generation, and one of the things I love about it is how spartan people's apartments are. And I often use this, actually, as a reference in real life, talking about how wonderful often life is when you get away from owning lots of things. In Star Trek, every single thing they own is something super important. They don't need extra things because their environment is very carefully selected and designed so that they have exactly what they need and nothing more and nothing less. Now, of course, they have a whole spaceship with them and other people, so if they're missing something, there's ways to deal with it, and they have replicators for those things that are really hard. They don't have to have full kitchens. They have a lot of excuses, and it's a TV show. It's not realistic. They never have to show them with a dirty, drying, towel rack or anything. They just skip that stuff. You ever notice their crew quarters often don't have bathrooms? Sometimes they do, often they do not. So yes, it's not exactly a you can just look at this, but I love the Star Trek thing. I often say when I live places, I want to live a lot like Star Trek. I don't want to own things just to own them. I want every object to be something of value and meaning, and I want to have devices that really do a good job for me, that do exactly what I need and what I want, do it super efficiently, and so I don't need lots of different things. I like paring down. Um, and so this is a mentality. Uh, uh, when I look at Star Trek The Next Generation, that is, that is something that's in my mind with moving all the time. When I lived in the United States, I had loads of stuff. It was the polar opposite of Star Trek. In, in no way was it Spartan, and in no way was it in space. Still not in space, but I have traveled to a new and adventurous place, and I've cut down what I own a lot. My office is actually uh, an outlier in my house that it's full of equipment, both because I deal with other people's equipment here and making the show, and shows, I have many shows, use a ton of equipment, plus I, this is my full working environment. And so lots of my crew come in and use things here, and I have to have studio lights and all kinds of things that practically just you have to have a certain number of things, which we'll try to get to as well. But most of my life, my bedroom almost empty. Uh, my living room has no furniture. My house is bare, even with a family of five being here and with uh, staff that come and go all the time. This place is insanely empty. And we still often feel like we have too many things. And as I go around my office, I'm always like, do I really need this? Do I really need that? I try to come up with fewer and fewer things over time and very carefully purchase new things that will move in that direction. This one thing is going to maybe cost a little bit more, but I only need one thing instead of three. And given the way that we live, it just tends to work out better, even if it's the same price, maybe just a little bit more. Often I find that investment well worth it. Not 100% of the time, but quite often. Watch any American sitcom and what do you see? Clutter, clutter, clutter. Yet, where is it on Star Trek? Not sure how much it is by design, because they have the food replicator. They do safe stuff that they might need years later because they can just replicate it as needed. Totally true. They do not have that American fear of poverty anymore. Good point. And most, and this is a good point that much of the world does not. The idea that you have things uh, to hedge against poverty um, is very American. Now, anybody anywhere in the world wants to hedge against poverty, but the means by which Americans tend to do it, which actually creates a lot of poverty, uh, or the effects of poverty, um, is, is relatively unique. There aren't very many places in the world where collecting things is seen as a positive. People may be like, oh cool, you have a thing, but having a house full of things just seems like invitation to robbery, or uh, real pain to move, or an issue to clean, or just 
weird. Why would you spend so much money on things that just sit on the shelves when you could spend that money on uh, retirement investments to let you retire early or more securely or spend it on food or flights or travel? Not everyone likes to do the same things, but nearly everyone likes the comfort of having a lot of income or investments. And for me, one of the things that I like owning far more than things is businesses. And the nice thing about businesses is that potentially, if you're good, they might actually help pay for your life in the future. So uh, everyone has a different approach to this, but I know people who uh, had problems with food poverty when they were young, mostly because of a drug addiction or whatever, and um, would then keep pantries, like just chock full of food that they would never eat and end up throwing away. Cost them a fortune, but it made them feel comforted because they had had this food trauma situation when they were young, and it's one of the ways that they dealt with it. Many Americans, especially those who grew up more poor, often feel like they cannot buy things that they want to have, and so they go out and they buy lots and lots of things. And when you're surrounded by lots of things, it gives a certain comfort uh, to people who have that uh, form of poverty trauma or, or uh, history where they, they feel like, other people had things and they didn't and they, they felt like they were being left behind, which is real. It's a real thing in America that people, and other places too, but the, coming from the United States and growing up in the United States, you sense it a lot more, this idea that, you know, oh, a bunch of my friends have this thing and I don't. And even if I have 10 things that they don't have, they still have something I don't have and it makes me feel like I'm at a disadvantage. It makes me feel poor even if I'm not. And that's, that's incredibly real. One of the things we love about living in Nicaragua is not only do we not have those feelings, but our kids don't have those feelings. Our kids basically never have ask for anything. We go shopping, we're like, what do you want? You want stuff? Let's just get it. And my daughters are constantly like, five dollars? I don't need that for five dollars. Two dollars maybe, right? They're constantly, even where some things are so cheap and we buy so little, they're like, why would we need to buy this thing? It's just things. I don't need this thing. I don't really want this thing. And in America, my thought process was always, I hope more things are better, right? Fill the shelves, have more stuff. I'll use it sometime. And I still feel that way. It's something I fight a lot with. My kids have managed to break themselves of that partially because they grew up with parents who had already kind of even if emotionally had not tackled that, had logically tackled that to some degree, but also because we live other places. They don't have this peer pressure of everybody owns this thing, so you gotta own it too. And, and my kids constantly mock me for how many things I buy. I buy so many video games. I mean, three to 4,000 on Steam, GOG, Epic, and so forth. They're constantly like, would you just stop buying games? We can't find what we want. We own more than we will ever play. We don't need any more. This is the thing that comes up at least once a week they say this, not because I've necessarily bought something new, just because they have to go through the list and find stuff. We're always downloading and trying new games. They appreciate that we have a massive catalog of games, but, they understand that we're spending money on things they probably won't use and that it's a collection. Even though it's not taking up any space in the house, it doesn't take any effort, you don't see it, it still exists. And they're like, why? Why would we have so many things? We don't need them. And most anything intangible uh, can be easily stored in a computer much like today, like I just said with video games, movies, music, any of that stuff, well, that is easily stored. But even if you have a good military style vehicle for being prepared, even those do not have enough range to move to faraway countries. Um, I, I'm not sure what he's saying quite in that last uh, bit, but I have just a normal everyday car. I can throw my family in that car and move uh, to any number of countries really, really easily from Panama to Mexico, no effort at all. I mean, I just went to Belize. It's easier to drive to Belize than to fly to Belize uh, by quite a bit. Um, and even going to South America, like Colombia, it's easy to do that with a car. But the less you have, the easier it is to move. So it's an that's an important thing. If you ever are concerned about the need to move, the less you have, the more you can take everything you do have with you at the drop of a hat. Now, I'm not saying that everyone should go down to the point where you can easily throw it all in luggage and go. I did that for a while, but that was extreme and not, not necessarily recommended. But having uh, everything pared down to the point where I can put it in a car and go, at least the necessities, is a big deal. And that we could put it, we have two cars, so we could put everybody in two cars, all the dogs, all the stuff that we need. We could actually do, and that does provide a bit of comfort. What if the world just goes crazy and we need to bug out? We can without giving everything up, without feeling like we're tied down unnecessarily. All right, he says, if I had already converted all my DVDs into computer files, then of course the physical DVDs would matter less. I do want to say, one, I did this conversion. It was not a big effort. Some effort, yes, but not a big one. It's, you know, I did it 20 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, when it was a lot slower and a lot harder than it is now. Also, you don't need to convert them before you go. 
You just don't. That's not a thing. So I know it feels like there's a big effort here, and I'm not saying that there's no effort, but if I had 10,000 DVDs, I'm going to tell you it's not a big deal. It really isn't. Um, now, maybe there's some things that are being missed as to how you do it, how it works when you get to other places, what you would do. I get it. But I'm telling you, I just recently did this again because the DVDs I had converted weren't worth copying around. It was so easy to get them another way for all the things I already owned that it's impossible for me to describe just how easy this process is, right? So little effort. You can't put them in boxes for the effort that I have to not have to deal with that. Um, he says, however, I do not understand this big cloud trust that is all out there in the internet either. So first of all, that's not what we're doing. We're not saying you should trust everything in the cloud. I'm not saying you shouldn't. It's just not something that I've brought up. You should get to cloud trust, right? You're, you're looking at moving places and this is just going to make your life way easier. And there is a massive, massive misunderstanding. Uh, so I come from a technology background, right? This is, I'm a technologist. Um, do you, uh, so first of all, do you trust your house versus uh, um, a storage unit, right? Well, both have different risks different protections, and you need to understand them. Most people do understand them because they're physical, they're very straightforward. You know that your house is more likely to be broken into than a storage unit, but uh, you can monitor it and feel comfort that you know that nothing's been taken and you can hide really important things. Yes, they may take your sofa, but you can hide that one thing that you really need to hide. They're never gonna find it in that secret wall panel. But if your house burns down, you're, you're out of luck. Storage units very rarely have fires. They're built out of things that really don't burn and they're very hard to break into. They have a lot of security, but you can't monitor them. And I have a storage unit I haven't seen in years. I assume no one's gotten into it, but I don't know, right? That's reality. I kind of wish they did and stole everything. It would make my life a lot easier. Uh, but uh, the idea that you can't trust cloud, it's exactly the same. You should never have the emotional response that cloud is bad, or that not cloud is bad. That should never come up. That's like saying, storing in my house, automatically bad. Storing in a storage unit, automatically bad. No, that's crazy. Both have value, right? Storing things on your own has value. But when you're moving abroad, that value plummets really quickly for two reasons. One, everything that you take with you has risk to being just effort to take, uh, uh, can be destroyed, whatever. The other is that it can easily be lost, right? It doesn't take very much when you're moving all your stuff around for it to not, that box didn't make it. Oh my gosh, where'd that box go? Someone stole it. Uh, it got damaged, water damage. That's not gonna matter for DVDs, but something, right? Fire damage, fell off the ship, got crushed, um, simply got lost, never made it to the end. Uh, you name it, people lose their stuff when shipping all the time. And if you're putting that stuff in a car and driving it down through Mexico, it's just begging for someone to pull you over and steal stuff out of your car. Once they realize it's DVDs, they'll just throw it on the side of the road and punch you in the face. But it's going to uh, encourage bad things to happen. Whereas if you put all that stuff in a cloud, one, cost you almost nothing. Two, none of those risks that I said are there. Three, the reliability of that stuff stored in the cloud is thousands to millions of times safer than storing it anywhere that you have possession of. And you can be as emotional as you want about that, but emotions play no, no role in risk assessment. Once they are, you're admitting you're wrong, right? That's just, that's your brain saying, I know I'm doing something that isn't safe. Look, we all do it. This is not about you, anyone who's watching this. All humans have this emotional reaction and it is dangerous when you're doing risk assessment, you have to let it go. You have to look at real risks. If you're storing your DVDs in something like Backblaze B2, it has 11 nines durability, which is another way of saying you can't do anything. There is nothing within your power that can come close to what they're providing every day for very little money. That's a smarter way to go. That is not what you should do here, but that would be a smarter way to go. Now, remember, at no point did I say you should trust the cloud. I never said that was the answer. What the real answer is, is just getting to the place you're gonna go and downloading them new. This takes no effort, no time, so easy, and completely legal in most places. And since you already own them, it's even legal in the United States. You just don't wanna deal with the policies of it in the United States. Uh, but you already own them, right? We're not talking about pirating stuff you don't own. We're talking about downloading already converted copies of what you already own that someone has already done for you to make your life super duper crazy easy. Uh, so that's what I'm recommending. But if you don't feel like doing that, do the conversion. It's so easy. Everything's so easy except shipping your DVDs. And worse, 
possibly needing to ship them again, and definitely worse, shipping them and have something go wrong, right? These are all things you want to avoid. So I'm, I'm literally addressing your exact situation and trying to make this as easy for you today and as easy for you tomorrow. This isn't a one-time thing. This is a makes it easier the rest of your life, not just a gets you through the next few weeks. I understand sometimes we're in a rush. Right now, we just don't have the energy, whatever, and you're like, I wish I could make life easier. I think just grabbing this box and putting it in a, in a crate is going to be the easiest thing. It's not. It doesn't really make sense. I can't stress enough this specific case. I can't come up with a situation more dramatic than how bad shipping DVDs is and how good not shipping DVDs is. There, this is the biggest single divide. And I know we're just using it as an example, but this is the most extreme of how good because every single aspect of not shipping them is better. It's lower cost, better safety, lower risk, and way more usable. And bringing the DVDs is just a bunch of negatives. Literally, every aspect of it is negatives, unless you just really love holding DVDs and looking at the picture on the box, which I do understand having shelves full of DVDs has a feeling that's kind of cool, but it's a lot of extra work, it is a lot of extra money, and it is feeding this emotional ownership comfort thing, which ultimately it never is going to be good for you. Maybe we can't let it go. Right? Everyone has a certain amount of it just built in and it's hard to fight against. That's real. But recognizing that it's an, it's a bit of unhealthy. It's not good for us. Just like, you know, that extra slice of chocolate cake. Sometimes we just need it. I understand that. But at no time is that extra slice of chocolate cake good for you. So just keep that context. I don't understand this big cloud trust that is all out there in the internet either. I would like to see a bit more tangible. Remember, tangible is emotional bad, right? There's no upside to tangible. It feels good, but there's no actual benefit. And the conversion of all those DVDs, which is zero, you don't have to do that. But if you do do it, trivial, is too much of a huge time commitment right now. I understand his right now, maybe he's trying to move really fast. That's why I'm saying don't do that. I didn't need to bring my collection with me. I far easier, better ways to solve that. Easily a half hour per DVD. I don't think it should take that long, but it's been a little while since I've done it. I think it should be much closer to five to 10 minutes, but legit, it's not zero. Uh, boxing them up does not take nearly that long. No, not the boxing, but you have to include all the shipping and unboxing and shelving and any potential reboxing in the future. But again, that's not the process I'm recommending. Uh, many of us older people are not really all that computer savvy anymore. I, seriously, you don't need to be. Like, it's so easy. We have a guide for it, I think. Crazy, crazy easy. Um, and that is how you get your movies onto your phone. I don't know where phone comes from here, but yes. So the system that I'm recommending gives you movies literally anywhere you can imagine. On your laptop, on your, on your desktop, on your television, on your phone if you want. All those things the way that I do it, which I'm not saying is the way you guys need to do it. Yes, I get all those things automatically. It's so good. The degree to which it's better than having a DVD. I would just throw my DVDs. If you brought me all my DVDs, set them up, I'd be like, okay, can we throw these all out now? I don't want them in my house. I don't want them in the way. I don't want to ever pull one off the shelf. I understand I don't want to look at the boxes. They're not that cool. It's not like an old LP record or something or Laserdisc. Those were cool to look at. DVDs, not so much. Um, DVDs were after the era of cool cinema, right? They just didn't care that much. But I don't ever want to have to go stand at a shelf, go look through everything, pull a box out, pull a disc out, carefully not touch it, go find an antique DVD player machine that plugs in through an antique, who knows how you even plug that into a television anymore, uh, put in a disc. You can't buy any of this. I haven't seen a DVD player here. I've not seen DVDs for sale. I don't know that you could get one, right? What if anything happens to that? Now you're shipping in antique DVD players from the United States trying to, that, those are big and bulky and huge. Like this is weird. I'm sure there's some in the country, but I've not seen one. DVDs went away 20 years ago, right? Think about this. Nothing uses that anymore. You can't even get DVD players on laptops or anything or desktops. Like, how are you going to use these DVDs, uh, especially going into the future? You might be able to pull off, well, I have old stuff now that'll still play them. What about in a year or two or 10, right? What happens when HDMI goes away and the last remnants of the final DVD players from long ago have nothing to connect to and nobody cares because no one has a DVD anymore, right? You're just making more and more cost and work for yourself for the rest of your life. And it can be fixed right now with 
no, there's no way to compare the effort of putting that stuff in a box to just grabbing copies once you're already here, right? You can't. It's so much work at the worst time. Why do all that work now when you can do even less work and do it later and only on demand when you need it or whenever you care, or whenever you're just feeling in the mood, right? So, um, but yes, being able to watch something on your phone when you feel like it, being able to take things with you when traveling, if you feel like it, these are all things that DVDs don't allow or they do, but you have to do this conversion process before you can do that. So yeah, I'm just saying like, there's never been a moment like the present to fix this problem. And while we're having this back and forth discussion, you, how many do you have? A thousand? They'd be converted pretty quickly. And it's something you do in the background, right? You're walking by, oh, this one's done. Just pop in another disc hit go and grab the next one. Totally did that myself. I'm not talking about something I haven't done myself to huge collections. And I'm telling you in every step, I had the same arguments and regretted the same decision. So I'm, this is not me hypothesizing. This is me telling you what I've lived through. He says, and I do have extra DVD players. Now, again, this is more stuff. Of course, if you're going to do this and keep all these DVDs, you're certainly going to want extra DVD players. But this is more things that are easy to break, more things you have to ship, more things you have to store, more things that could be damaged during shipping and so forth. It just, it's, it's building, right? The DVDs are leading to DVD players, which are going to lead to cables, which are going to lead to old TVs. And these are just so many things that could be eliminated. Uh, you don't need anything. I can watch all of my movies here without any extra devices. I do have a computer uh, at home, so that is a, an assumption, but that's in my office. I can go anywhere in the house, including on my cell phone, and watch the stuff. I can even travel. That takes a little bit more work, but I can travel and watch everything that I have without taking anything with me, without putting anything at risk. These are big benefits uh, for a lot of people. For me, I don't travel with movies. I don't watch movies barely at home anymore, but this flexibility is a big deal. For your friend who's a missionary, though, one of the big deals about this is protection. By putting all that stuff on a hard drive, presumably his DVD still existed somewhere. That became a backup copy. He can also copy that hard drive somewhere else and have an actual backup copy where there's a lot of protection. If someone steals his, his hard drive or it drops or it just goes bad, he has another, he can make another backup and keep working and not lose all those things. I know so many people who have ruined or lost their DVDs over the years and are constantly rebuying them or simply losing things that they had and not having access to them anymore because they don't have the money to rebuy it or it's not available anymore or whatever. Even if you own DVDs, you really want to get them protected. Now he does say, um, I already sometimes tend to just convert a DVD before I watch it. So perfect. You're doing the right process. Why not just accelerate that some um, if you're going to do that? Again, I'm saying that's extra work that you really don't need to do, but I think that's a good way to go. And for a while I did that as well. It's so much easier to watch it when it's not a DVD that uh, why, why use it as a DVD at all? Uh, I have DVDs of my favorite TV shows that they do not even produce such good TV shows anymore. I feel exactly the same way. Loads and loads of TV shows that are impossible to get, um, but I've you know, I have them protected in such a way that I don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, I somehow seem to have misplaced a very favorite CD. Finding it on the internet makes it seem less urgent to find my CD. And of course, I've already properly bought it, but that does not at all mean that I am ready to just throw all my CDs into the trash. This is what I'm saying, though. It's seriously worth throwing them in the trash. Maybe 10,000 CDs? Like, I had quite a collection, and the value is now zero. Literally zero. Negative. Any amount of storing them is just punishment. It's throwing good money after bad, right? There's nothing more irrational in business than sunk cost fallacy. And that's really what we're struggling with, all of us, when we're looking at these things. We've already purchased these things, and so even though they may not hold any value anymore, that makes us sad. And if they actually hold negative value, like we have to pay to move them and pay to store them and potentially pay to move them again and risk them being damaged, all of these things are huge negatives that may not need to exist anymore. And it's this emotional tie to, but I've already spent money on them. I'd have to throw them away. Yes, but you have to acknowledge that they are already worthless or negative value trash. Just like anything else, if something has no or negative value, you want to get away from it as fast as possible. You're just going to get your best value right now. This is one that's going to make the biggest difference. He then says, is such downloading legal in both Ecuador and in Belize? It is unique to the United States to make acquiring things you've already bought illegal. That is only an American thing. Everywhere else, you can do that. Now, there are places where they still may create some problems for you and you would have to prove that you were legal. 
I don't think in either of those you're going to have any problem. The entire world works this way, especially, especially Latin America. So this, the idea that you can't use what you already own in, in logical ways is purely an Americanism. And I realize that it makes that often seem like a much bigger thing than it is. Uh, but, um, you know, you can easily work around those things in those countries, even if they were to monitor it. I do not believe that they do because that is how every single person there lives. They will, you'll be the same as everyone else. Um, except everyone else is actually pirating them. You actually legally own them. You're just using the same mechanisms that pirates use to make your life easier so that you don't have to suffer in ways that pirates don't have to suffer. Um, this is one of those things where the United States has made uh, both because of the way the U.S. interacts with big business and the way the big business treats customers in the United States, they've made it beneficial to be a pirate. They don't allow you to pay more to get treated as well as pirates do in other places. So while you have paid and have that right, it's, it's a weird situation. Uh, you say you have boxes of family photo slides from long ago. Of course you want to keep those, right? Uh, I do not want to pay the big money to send it all off to be digitized right now, maybe later with it, when and if I am rich. Okay, the one thing you got to be aware of there is that if you do it now, it's going to be relatively cheap. And if you do it later, it's going to be really dangerous and expensive. I don't know of places in any of these countries that have digitization services. They all go to the United States. Uh, if you're going to do that, you're looking at um, shipping all that stuff out of the U.S., shipping it all back to the U.S. Each of those cases has wear and tear, the risk of it being lost or damaged, the possibility of them getting, you know, uh, radiation or wearing out or whatever. That's pretty minor, but you're just adding cost and, and stuff. If you're thinking of digitizing them, I highly recommend doing it now um, or look at buying the equipment to digitize and bring it with you and at least digitize yourself even after you've moved. I am totally taking all my original photos with me. That is not something I'm getting rid of, um, but mine are already digitized. So in my day-to-day -day usage, I have access to all those photos. I certainly would never move them without them being backed up. With all this stuff, your DVDs, your CDs, your photos, if it's worth putting in a box, this is important. You, you can't make... I don't feel that there's the possibility of hinting at the argument that it's worth putting in a box and shipping with you if you haven't already protected it in some way. So for me, if I felt that I needed to bring a DVD, a Blu-ray, a photo, anything with me, the first thing I would say is I have to protect it before I'm willing to ship it. Nothing worth shipping makes sense if it's not worth protecting. This is basic from business world, right? Don't store anything you're not backing up. If it's not important enough to back up, it's not important enough to store. Same thing goes here, especially for these kinds of things. All the effort and money and time that goes into shipping you don't want to do that for something that isn't important enough to protect ahead of time. So the photos, maybe you want to keep them in the U.S. And, and have someone digitize for you in the future. They're probably not taking up a lot of space. You can probably find someone who has a nice, dry, cool environment to store them in, in a nice box that'll keep them safe for, very, for a really, really long time. Great. You want to put them into something really safe and bring them with you? I'd say digitize them first. And I know that it takes some money. It's really, it's very cheap to digitize yourself, but it does take time. I totally understand. All of ours were digitized ourselves. We didn't send them off anyway. We're, we're not rich like that. Uh, when Kindle gets sold, or the, which is never going to happen, that doesn't make sense. Let's just say that, right? Kindle has been just an integrated part of Amazon for decades. Uh, or the new file format comes out, also not a problem. Um, all your books could suddenly be gone. Sure, if you're buying them on Kindle and not downloading standard formats. That is not a real world risk for people who are concerned about that. Some people just want temporary stuff and they, like my wife, just gets Kindle Unlimited. Everything's like a library. You pay a few dollars a month and everything's temporary. So the concept of all this, you don't have to worry about it. Um, anything you normally buy as a digital book or download, whatever, they don't come in Kindle formats. They come in standard formats that are open. They can't go away. Formats that are open haven't gone away since the history of the computer. Um, and they're not going to, right? So um, now he says, it's not yours unless you have the actual unrestricted files and adequate backups. All true. Things that are extremely cheap and easy to do. I still buy a certain number of books. I do this for 100% of them. This is exactly what I do. Um, if you do not trust your so-called old country's government, then why should we trust big cloud? Well, one, because they're unrelated, right? Um, cloud is protected across the world, not within a single country. Um, but basically, this just goes into a, these are disconnected processes, and there's nothing about big government that should make you worry about big cloud. You also should never call things big cloud because that's not what it is. 
right? These are independent businesses doing independent business things. And also, why are we talking about cloud? Nothing leading up to that sentence was about cloud. So I'm not sure where cloud comes into this, but I feel like when there's something that needs to be done by you, that in theory, you could leverage a cloud service to make maybe easier for you, maybe. Like in this case, you could put your books on cloud, sure. Um, I, don't, I don't know why you necessarily would, but you, you certainly can. But nothing here implies that, and then you jump to not doing this thing because of this unrelated thing, um, which you don't trust because of yet another unrelated thing, right? If you don't trust your, the United States government, why would I trust companies, right? That's, that's literally what that sentence says, and it, that gets into a dangerous situation. Well, now you don't trust anything, so we're basically using it as an excuse to not make good decisions, not do good risk analysis because of an emotional response to it. So it's just, we gotta be careful with that, right? We'll, we'll put ourselves in dangerous positions and put ourselves at risk and, and spend lots of money because of, yeah, we don't really trust our government. I'm not expecting you to trust the US government, but I don't know how it's possible that any degree of distrust of the American government makes you not trust other people providing data protection services to you, right? Like that's, that's so now business doesn't, how, how do you trust getting on an airplane or how do you trust doing anything at that point, right? If you're going to assume that not trusting one entity means also not trusting another entity that's not connected to that first one. Okay, he goes on in the, so now finally into the next comment. A lot of Americans are looking for uh, the America of decades ago, before all the gender confusion, before all the homelessness, there was always quite a bit of that, but um, before all the mental illness and drug abuse, before giant corporations or investors bought up mobile home parks to jack up the land rent and make old people homeless, many other countries are like this country was decades ago, before all the rampant corruption. Uh, it's, uh, a lot of it's, I think, just exposure of rampant corruption now. Um, at least, you know, I grew up in the 70s. It was bad. Um, and those other countries are rising while even Trump says we are in decline. Um, he doesn't really have a question there. Uh, and, uh, the next uh, comment, I understand it is not whether other countries measure up in their medical care, but rather that the U.S. is unaffordable and has the worst medical monopoly. Absolutely true. Uh, why is it that you need outdated retro 1980s computers? Because I grew up in that era. I started working in technology in 1985, and 8-bit uh, computers are nostalgic for me, right? I'm So I was born in 1976, and that means that the first uh, non-kit home computer was also from 1976. The home computing revolution happened during my life. When I was one, it was one. When I was five, it was five. And that's a weird tie-in. I have been into computers since I can remember. I literally don't remember a time that I wasn't passionate about computers, and I started learning to program at nine. Uh, and And my whole childhood was hoping to get access to those original 8-bit computers up until 1984 when I finally got access to a 16-bit computer. And that's when I used after that. But during those early years, when I was a little kid, those 8-bit computers were the things on TV, the things that I heard about kids who had, things that other public rich schools had, things that I saw on, on training videos when I took the uh, computer... Um, Oh, oh my gosh, I forgot the name of it. Bits and Bytes, the show that taught you how to use computers. In 1983, those were the computers they were showing. There were no 16-bit. There were no 32-bit. It was 8-bit only. And that is the world I grew up in. So to me, those things aren't technology. To me, those things are nostalgia. They're romantic. They are, uh, they are a tie to my young childhood that other things don't give me. I had very few toys, not because we were poor. I just wasn't into toys other than Legos when I was young. Of course, I was into toys. I had toys. But the amount that other kids are in, were into toys and, and stuff like that and things that they played with other kids and imaginary stuff, I didn't have that kind of childhood. I didn't have that, a brain that really made those things make sense to me. When I did Legos, it was for architecture. It wasn't for role play or whatever. Like a lot of people like, you know, characters from uh, Playmobil because they put together stories. I didn't do that. I did build things, not stories. Computers were my childhood. And, um, and it wasn't really video games either. I liked computers as tools for work. I became a business consultant because that's how I 
grew up. To me, that is a childhood dream come true. And I know it sounds crazy, but things like databases are things that I've always loved. When I was really little, those are things I was passionate about. Computer programming languages. Since I was young, not to make video games. Not that I don't like video games. I love video games. But I like them as an ancillary thing. I like video games, yes, but my passion for computers was because I have a passion for computers as tools to do amazing things. I love the sound of early keyboards. I like the look of those early 8-bit uh, green and amber screens. I like the, the all the, the accoutrements that came back then. Computers represented hope and, and future and dreams, and, uh, and we all wanted them. And so um, as, as I got older, I was finally able to afford some of those things I wasn't able to have as a kid, and so I collected them and still have them. Uh, you start to sound like me There's there for a moment. Maybe you should watch 8-Bit Guy. He has some cool videos. I have watched 8-Bit Guy. I'm familiar with some of his videos. Um, I'm very specific in what I like. Mostly Commodore computers. I do have a few Apples. I have some, a, a good story about one that actually uh, was won by my mother as a child, and after she died, it was gifted to me, unbeknownst to the person who had it, who thought I was just a computer collector, and ended up giving me my mother's computer from my, my childhood. I have some cool ones that I just think are neat uh, that I've collected, but my Commodores are my pride and joy. I always loved Commodore, and the first computer that I ever got to really have of my own was a... a Commodore Amiga 1000, the first generation of the Commodore Amigas, the 16 bits. Um, I also, because I did a lot on the original Macs, I never owned one, but friends and companies lent them to me when I was very young, eight, nine, ten years old. Uh, I now own three of those original, and they all work, right? So I love being able to put my hands on them and, and see what it looked like. It really brings me back. Nothing else brings me back like actually touching those, those old, old computers. And I'm watching this on a Linux desktop with a 27-inch monitor. So most of my computers are Linux. I do have a number of Mac now. Now, but I do do Linux. And for those who don't know, I wrote Linux administration best practices. I've been a Linux guy since 1997. I was a Unix guy since 1994. Uh, <clears throat> that a friend installed Linux for me. I'm not confident of my ability to install Linux. Seriously, you just pop in the, the USB drive and say yes, 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 done. Like That's it. There's nothing more to it. It's the easiest thing to install. Um, surely do not expect me to stuff this computer into a suitcase. It is not a foldable laptop. So this is a really great example where we can take a completely different thing from the DVDs and all this stuff and talk about, does it make sense for you to have a Linux desktop? This is a really great moment where it's important to potentially, we talk about this a bit in other things, to reevaluate the things that you have. So you already have a Linux desktop. I already had a video game desktop. I know TJ had a big computer he wanted to bring down. For uh, when you become an expat, there are things in your lives, life you want to reevaluate. Now, I don't know why you have a uh, Linux desktop. Maybe you're doing special stuff with it. Maybe it's, you know, you need it for a very special reason. You just haven't mentioned it because you didn't think we needed to know. That's fine, and maybe there's a really good reason for having it, but chances are that this is a big item that is now an encumbrance once again. For me, everything, I had big computers before I moved. Every one of them got converted to a laptop. I prefer desktops, trust me, or a super mini desktop. So I have a Mac mini behind me, and in the other room, I have a little tiny uh, B-Link, which is, uh, in this case, is running Windows because it's not for me. But <clears throat> uh, I had one just like it that ran Linux, uh, but I keep my Linux laptop right here. I'm actually just going to pull it out because I literally have it in front of me. I have uh, an employee's Windows laptop right here, but under it is my Acer Linux laptop, right? So I have this right here. This was, um, I think, $450, right? Not a ton of money. Um, bought it new. It's beautiful, works great, has HDMI output, so I can hook it to a 27-inch monitor. I can hook up all the keyboards and stuff to it. It's got an NVIDIA graphics card. If you're doing something that requires that, you could do that on there. You can play video games on it, like all the things. Um, so for me, instead of having a Linux desktop like I had before we moved, this saved me so much space and paid for itself in not having to pay the taxes on importing a big computer because they don't see that as a tourist thing. Uh, these come in for free. The desktops have to be shipped, and either it's going to be part of your big shipment, in which case you're paying shipping, or it's going to be part of, most likely, something where you pay duties. When I brought in my $600 uh, Windows uh, um, computer, they charged me between two and $300 of taxes on that. That's a lot of taxes to pay for something that I could basically buy again for twice that. Not, It's not the same, right, as completely replacing it again, but it's a big expense that I don't necessarily have to have. So having a, a desktop that's obviously not brand new, maybe it's just a month old, maybe it's a year old, maybe it's 10 years old, um, 
But that is something to seriously consider. Why keep something that is suited to your old life, but very poorly suited to your new life? And if you're only moving one time, yes, you know, you're like, okay, I'm just gonna, one time I'm gonna get into the final house, I never have to pick it up again. Maybe it's worth paying 50% import duties to just have it, right? But what if you ever need to move houses? What if you ever need to move to another place? What if you ever need to pack up and go quickly? What if you ever just want flexibility? Having a desktop, a big desktop that you don't need is going to make that harder and more expensive when having a laptop is something you throw in a backpack and go. I understand your goal is to be stationary, so it's not the way that you're thinking. Every expat moves to laptops, except for TJ, Big video gamer, it's worth it for him to make, and he knows he's making a giant investment. He's spending a fortune to import TVs and stuff specifically for his gaming. Sometimes you have to do that. And maybe that's what you're doing, Yosef. Maybe yours is a special case where it really does make sense to have a, a desktop and it's worth bringing it down. But you're referring to it not as, I'm gonna keep it because it you're not saying this, right? It's not in the statement that it's it's the right thing for you. You're, say you're just saying, I already have it. Do you want me to really put this in a suitcase? No, I don't want you to bring it at all. Um, you say it's not a foldable laptop. Right, you get a foldable laptop. I am not a fan of laptops, but they are what is going to make sense almost always when coming down. If it's for some reason a laptop doesn't work for you, then consider moving to a super micro uh, computer. I don't have one here, but they're so small and they, they treat them like a laptop. They're so small, they never have never been charged for one. Very, very easy. I brought multiple down when I first came down. I came down with a laptop and three desktops. The only one they hit me for is the big one. The big video gaming one that was for my kids to play video games, they charged me an arm and a leg. Both my really expensive Mac mini, de they didn't charge me a thing for that. My little bit older uh, Linux desktop, they didn't charge me a thing for that because it's little. And my laptops never once have we been charged, never will be charged, right? Because laptops are allowed. So like the DVDs, I think this is a spot where you have a big opportunity to make a big improvement where with a little bit of rethinking and maybe actually some cost savings or breaking even if you're being creative, maybe we don't know enough details, you may be able to make moving down something that is so trivial that you don't need to worry about all these things. What if you could have a Linux laptop that has all of your movies in it? You don't have to worry about anything else. You don't have to bring that big computer. You don't have to bring those DVD players. You don't have to bring that DVD collection. You don't have to bring that CD collection and it's all just boom, there it is. That's a big change from needing to bring down shipping containers or, or pallets uh, and paying all that money to just throw it in a backpack and you are completely mobile and all that stuff, that comfort of having everything you own coming with you all the time is there. And if you're willing to use the cloud, you can have automatic backups or automatic storage that replicates that to give you a insane degree of, and no matter how little trust you have, you can have zero trust. It can be known to delete all of your stuff every six months. And even so, it provides you the protection you need, guaranteed. No risk, right? No risk, that's the great thing. That lack of trust doesn't matter because it works. Demonstrably, you don't have to trust it. So if you're doing it right, right? Because it doesn't take, you don't have this requirement to put everything in the cloud. You don't have a requirement to put anything in the cloud except your backup copies. And your backup copies, you put them back every day. So even if they're deleting them on a regular basis, that's not convenient, but it's not going to make it not make sense for you. And that never happens, right? The entire world's economy is gone at that point, and your DVDs are worth nothing, your house is on fire, people are shooting you in the streets. Like, you don't have to worry. None of the logic goes out the window at that point. Everything you're considering doesn't matter when you get to that point that, that every service in the world, every company in the world is just a free-for-all of, of not doing the thing. Like, no one's gonna keep paying. Everything will collapse, right? So. The collapse of civilization is not a spot where you worry about your DVD collection. That's, that's the takeaway. Uh, if the new country changes in a bad way, that is why we need these wicked days, dual citizenship and dual passports. Um, I'm not saying that those things are not valuable, but they're way overblown. They don't do the things that most people think they're going to do, right? That second passport is unlikely, given that you have an American passport. If you had, you know, some awful passport and you were like, but I need a powerful passport, yes, that 
makes sense whether it's rough days or not. But when you're talking about uh, the collapse of civilization, that second passport's probably going to be impacted in the same way as your first one is, and that second one is mostly going to be replicated by that first one. And in some of the places you're looking at moving, they're kind of tied together anyway. So for example, anything in the Commonwealth, Canada, Belize, UK, if the US goes down, chances are those are going to go with it. Those are, those are loosely coupled uh, passports as opposed to, say, a Brazilian passport, which will be completely uncoupled from the United States, but getting some of those are very hard. The ones that are not actually useful in the case of worldwide calamity are really easy to get for the most part. Ones that would be super useful in the case of world collapse, very hard to get. And it's very hard to estimate which ones really would be useful. Um, but in almost all cases, the belief is, should you be in a truly epically bad situation where you need a dual passport, they instantly become useless, um, or your original passport is unaffected, right? So even if the US completely collapsed, that does not mean that your US passport won't let you go places, right? And if it stops letting you go places, it also implies that any other passport you may have had also probably won't let you go places. So the idea that having a second passport is going to provide some protection, while it's not completely untrue, is mostly a scam. There are so many people who target people who believe in conspiracies and that kind of stuff and go for, you got to have this passport. It's like the passport conspiracy, right? This made up value. They create this fear that's not really legit. There's a lot of things to be afraid of, and a lot of your like corruption is like, oh, that's legit. Like, I'm not, I'm not questioning that stuff. I'm saying that there's other things that they will create fear about to drive you to a second passport. So it's not a fear that the U.S. is going to collapse. That's real that it could. I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying it could. Um, but that that collapse will lead you to needing or being able to use a second passport, that's where they're making it. They're making you afraid of your passport. Ah, this thing will happen, so this other thing might happen. Okay, this one, reasonable. This one, not. And so that's where this whole like drive for these extra passports probably isn't going to help you. If you do feel that you need to do that, if this is something that's really important to you, then really carefully considering which places you're going to want to go to. So places like Ecuador or Belize, 100% right off the table right now. If you're concerned about your American passport and power in the future, those are places that are very tightly coupled with the United States uh, within a passport context. So you would just assume that those passports would not be good for you uh, in the case where the United States went into collapse. Um, both of them have their currencies tied to the US dollar. Both of them are very tight partners with the United States. Uh, they're within the sphere of influence. And so um, you don't, those would be the specific passports that you would just rule out. You'd want to look at places that are much further away and much more independent uh, in the uh, new world. Yes, places like Nicaragua have very independent passports, but they're super weak, so that's not desirable. Uh, places like uh, Guatemala, a little bit stronger, but still super weak. Mexico, very strong. Brazil, quite strong. Uh, Chile, pretty good, right? You've got options, but be aware that the ones that everybody's going to try to sell you on, except for Mexico, probably don't make any sense. Panama, again, U.S. sphere of influence. Uh, I would like to make the move before the end of Trump's term, and if I have to digitize everything prior, that is a huge and unnecessary delay. I'm telling you it's not, right? Days. Like, get started, do all your other stuff, just keep it going in the background. Don't let it hold up your other life, but see if you can digitize everything. But more importantly, realize you don't need to digitize things. You can do it after you go. You don't have to do it ahead of time. There might be one or two movies you want to research and make sure that they're available because they're hard to find. I can tell you one I've lost access to is Tune In Tomorrow. If anyone knows how to find it, let me know. Um, but other than that, not a single thing lost. No effort. No prep. Nothing ahead of time. Um, yes, I'm sorry to consider Tiny Belize. This is weird because I feel like it violates every single thing you're looking for, but let's look. Uh, I don't know where in Belize yet, especially if it is easier. I don't know how it could be easier. Belize is definitely harder. Um, and so for those who don't know, I was in Belize a few days ago and I work in Belize. Um, I could learn Spanish after moving, but in Belize, I could skip that step. Now, that is true. Uh, you definitely, you know, Belize speaks English, so you're fine there, but that is, that is a not... Uh, it's, not, it's not part of your critical path, right? Meaning, uh, in getting from your home and you want to get to your new country, Spanish isn't in that path when coming to Nicaragua. You do not need Spanish to move here. I highly recommend, once you're here learning Spanish, it will improve your life here for sure. And yes, it will mean that Belize will have aspects of it that are better, faster. However, if you come to Nicaragua and live in an enclave, you don't need Spanish at all, everyone will speak English. In Belize, pretty much there only are enclaves. 
so you haven't actually solved anything. Under normal circumstances, everyone moving to Belize goes to an enclave, as opposed to Nicaragua, where there's a group that go to enclaves and a massive group that do not. Same as most countries. Very few countries are enclave only, or nearly enclave only. Belize really stands out that you can go around in Belize City, for example, where the majority of the population are, and never see an expat, never see a tourist. They just aren't there because everyone goes immediately into their enclaves and hides away from Belize itself. So in that way, Belize doesn't actually make things easier for you unless you make this huge effort to avoid those areas and go be with the Belizeans. So some of the things that are important about Belize, one, it is outrageously expensive, like truly epically expensive. Um, expensive like the United States at times, expensive like, I, you know, things that you've been concerned about in other comments from days ago lead me to believe that Belize may not even be a possibility for you. you. Probably can hunt around and find a place to live eventually, but it would be very, very hard. Things that would be very easy, for example, in low-cost Nicaragua um, in Belize are going to be very hard. You're going to be a foreigner on foreign money, so the, so the gringo effect is still going to be in place. Everyone's going to be looking to make extra money from you. You're going to be, you know, looking at higher prices for things if you're not careful. Same as in Nicaragua, right? Like, it, you can get good prices, but if you're not careful, you can end up with high prices. Um, <clears throat> but in uh, Belize, they're just not doing it in Spanish, they're doing it in English. Uh, but in Nicaragua, the, the poverty area is like, you can go anywhere, and it's pretty safe. Belize is quite dangerous, right? And and it's not like uh, Guatemala, where there's big areas that are safe, and then far off somewhere it's dangerous, where, you know, there's some criminal activity isolated out there, so you don't really feel it as someone living in Guatemala under normal circumstances. In Belize, normal people are impacted by the crime rate every day. Um, and so you find that Belize really does cater to the ultra rich as a place, any place like that, right? You, you, so all the things you're worried about in the United States, most of them get replicated in Belize. It's part of the Commonwealth, it's part of common law. So a lot of those issues, you're just gonna keep going in Belize, right? It's just, a, that's where that comes from, is from the Commonwealth. Um, so so th some of those things that you're stating as your reasons for leaving and things that you're seeking, lower cost uh, and so forth, uh, Belize is not addressing those problems. You have so many countries in the Western Hemisphere that address them to some degree. Belize does not. Um, so uh, I find it really surprising for it to even come up as an option. Um, and given that it's a place that I, uh, that I directly work and have experience with even this week, let alone just in general, um, kind of kind of works out. Now, it doesn't mean Belize is a bad place. Belize is perfectly nice and there's reasons to go there. And a lot of people like, just they want to be in English speaking and they're willing to pay a lot for that. They really want to be on the Caribbean. They're willing to pay a lot for that. They want the island life um, and so forth. And they're, they're willing to put up with millions of dollars of investment instead of thousands of dollars of investment because it's just what they want and they don't want to say they're in Nicaragua or they do want to say they're in the Commonwealth or whatever. And so, so there's reasons that people choose it for sure. And some people just like the food. Some people just like the lifestyle. Some people just like the differences, the little tweaks that are hard to explain. Absolutely. So that's fine, but be aware, anything that you have uh, cited except for Spanish, but even the Spanish in the way that it would apply, I would say every single thing that you cited as a potential concern with Nicaragua is magnified in Belize. So I find it a very strange one to be on even your long list. Like if there is something you could easily rule out, Seems like that would be it. Uh, do you understand that you are my source on Nicaragua? Well, I appreciate that a lot. Um, not like government schools or the Liar TV gave useful info, and it did not come up until recently in my YouTube viewing, which is surprising because it's such a perfect place for so many expats to at least consider. And honestly, I really don't feel from the things that you said about Nicaragua that it's the right place for you. I'm sticking to that. I'm saying it's an okay place for you. I think you'd do okay here. You'd come here and be like, it's not really what I was looking for, but it's okay. That's kind of, but I think you would certainly say, oh, it's way better than I was expecting, right? That's my anticipation. And I think you'd go to Belize and say, okay, yeah, it's not as bad as Scott made me think, but it isn't for me either. That is true, right? I think both of those things are probably true. But I think there's so much of Latin America um, that you probably would get to and go, wow, no, this is really for me. This is the thing I'm looking for. Um, but I would be super wary of, for example, Ecuador and, and Belize and, you know, those, there, there's a list of places that definitely are going to, in Costa Rica for sure, right? All, and, and probably Panama, places that are just not going to meet your needs. 
almost all places I've been in the last week, coincidentally. Um, I do not want to be close to the coast. That really, so in Belize, there is only the coast. So there is no being far from the coast. The farthest you can be from the coast is pretty close. Uh, but it's important to note, in Belize, there isn't mountains. So there isn't a cool area away from the coast. There's just near the water and not near the water. But not near the water in Belize gets really dangerously remote and quite unsafe pretty quickly in most cases. Uh, all of the uh, all the safety, all the infrastructure is right on the coast, but m not because it's so bad in Belize, just because the country is basically a coastline. It's a coastline with two major islands, uh, Key Calker and um, uh, and San Pedro. And so <laughs> La Isla Bonita, uh, literally that is the one. Um, and so there's Belize City and, and Placencia and Orange Walk and a couple major areas. And remember, the entire country is only the size of the city that I live in here. So it's a very, very small place. Uh, but all of it is on the water. Nobody lives in Belize away from the water. It just, where would you go? There's nowhere away from the water. So um, now maybe you don't care that you're near the water and you're just like, well, no, I'm not seeking the coast. That's fine. Uh, but be aware that that is how Belize uh, exists. Um... Not used to having too much heat nor salty air rotting my electronics or often having to repaint. Oh, no, you actually should have read that first. I'm sorry. You do not want to be in Belize then. This is that you just defined Belize, right? You're on the coast at salt air all the time. And there, there's no break from the heat. Even though it's not technically as hot as Nicaragua, it doesn't have locations that aren't hot. Everything is on the coast. Now, I was just there. It really was pleasant. Um, so it's noticeably not as hot as Nicaragua, but there isn't a non-hot area. Whereas Nicaragua, as an example, again, not the place for you, has these <coughs> really nice mountain areas, Madagalpa, Esteli, Hinotega, and so forth, where you can get relative uh, altitude and cooler temperatures um, without salt, without uh, the heat. It's still warm, for sure. Nicaragua never gets not warm, but it's less warm. It's noticeably fresher, uh, more wind, cooler wind, no salt, very different thing. All throughout Central America, you're going to find this the, the Cordata, the mountain range that goes to the middle. So Honduras, uh, El Salvador, Guatemala, Mexico, they're going to be loaded, not to Belize. And uh, uh, no, they're the only ones that have none of this. Um, uh, all of them have loads of mountains where you can get up to high altitude. Now, places like Guatemala, Mexico, they have really high altitudes. So you really notice it. Nicaragua, you notice it, but it's not like, whoa, I'm high in the mountains. It's just like, oh, this is, this is noticeably cooler, right? Um, but like Guatemala, I was just in Guatemala City. You feel it, right? You feel that the air is thinner. You feel that it is cool, cold even. Uh, completely different experience. And there's lots of Guatemala up at that. You don't have to be in the big city. You can go to very rural areas as well. I would encourage you to look at Guatemala uh, as it does. It has a lot of the things that you would potentially find really interesting in Nicaragua, uh, but with cooler temperatures and a lot of just slight tweaks on things um, and close to Belize, right? And should you go to any of these places and say, you know what? Oh, Scott was right, I do need to move to another one. If you have a car, all of this is very drivable. Belize is past all of Central America for me, 18 hours away, right? Um, I can be in any country in Central America, including Mexico, which is not in Central America. Technically, there's a sliver of it that is. I can be in all those in under, I think, 16 hours. I can be to every single country. Not necessarily to the, every part of every country. Can't be to far away Panama, can't be to far away Belize, can't be deep into Mexico, but I can be in any one of the countries in the region between Colombia and the United States in 16 hours, possibly less. That's not that bad. I know it's a long drive, but if you're moving countries and you're just popping everything in a car and going, there's value to that. That's a lot of countries to work with, right? That's, that's seven in Central America plus Mexico. So it's um, very quick uh, that you can, you can leverage the area by, by being able to, to check it out. And, and you may be like, oh, you know what? I like living in Guatemala for the price. I like visiting uh, Belize from time to time because of the, the language or whatever. You can just hop a bus and go back and forth. And it's a long bus depending on where you live, but it's not a big deal. Um, Yosef says, yes, I did watch many of Don Shader's videos, also GMAs. I'm looking for honest pros and con views, not just those trying to sell me something. Does Nicaragua have cheap hostels? Okay, so Nicaragua definitely has cheap hostels. I think everyone in the region does. Even, like, I find Costa Rica hostels, like, quite reasonable. Panama, from what I remember, pretty reasonable, but I haven't used a hostel there too recently. I was just there a couple days ago. Um, 
Nicaraguan hostel. So Brent was just here and I think he said he was under $10 a night. It was like $9 a night and included breakfast uh, in some pretty decent places. And now some places are going to be more for sure. But yeah, cheap hostels we certainly have. It's what the locals use and, um, uh, you know, they're decent, nothing flashy, uh, but they're for like families and, and business people traveling around the country and so forth. It's a very real thing that, that normal Nicaraguans use on a regular basis. So they tend to be pretty good. Of course, we have a lot of ones for backpackers and vacationers and, and such as well. Often they're not the same ones. Both may be cheap. Sometimes both are not cheap. Depends. Um, but yeah, Cheap hostels are a very normal thing, especially away from the beaches here. Um, uh, okay, I'm just going to read this thing. Something about... Uh, Yosef says, this is, this is in response to someone else, so I'm not sure how much of this is uh, relevant. You think you know me. I think this is talking to Janet. Uh, no, Patricia. Oh, he's talking to both Janet and Patricia. I'm not sure who's to. Uh, there likely is at least a few countries better than the deteriorating USA, for sure. Um, I think they were saying maybe you should just stay where you are. And he's being like, no, I really do want to move. I just haven't picked the right country yet. Um, I do not like do-it-yourself fireworks. Why not leave it to professionals? I likely would not like too much city noise. Uh, just want to point out, here in Nicaragua, no one does do-it-yourself fireworks. Everyone buys them because they're made in Leon. Their factories are here. It's terrible. Fireworks all the time, everywhere. Like, it never ends. So much noise in the cities. Uh, cold shower. Uh, hardly makes a difference if I already do not use much hot water. You might be surprised by how cold it can be here. A lot of the groundwater in a lot of the cities is rough. Managua, not. Uh, but so many people will tell you, oh, you don't need cold, sh you don't need hot water in Nicaragua. Yeah, you do. You really do. Most of the country needs it, uh, especially if you're going to be away from the coast. You're looking at up in the mountains. Ooh, you'll be sorry without some hot water. Uh, but I could probably afford a decent water heater. Yeah, like it's not a big deal. <laughs> I am looking to buy a home, not rent. So certain upgrades might be made for sure. And for a lot of us, we just use suicide showers. I hate them, but they work. Uh, heat and humidity. Move to a place less hot. Move to someplace not on the coast. Or they have these things called mini splits that work pretty well. It's reasonably 24-7 electricity. Yes, if you're here in Nicaragua... 24-7 electricity, not a problem. Ecuador, huge problem. So it depends where you are. Uh, we happen to be one of the best for electricity. Ecuador happens to be the worst right now. Uh, but most places you'll be fine. Um, and a lot of Latin America is actually very reasonable in temperature. Nicaragua really stands out as super hot. Uh, many places are more walkable than the U.S. for sure. Yep. Uh, us old people tend to be set in our ways, yet many expats are old people. It's true that, well, that's not how you say true. It is true that um, many expats are older uh, and older people tend to be set in their ways. Um, I think uh, uh, ex older folks who become expats naturally are less set in their ways. The nature of people willing to become expats uh, tends to make them more flexible. Uh, just naturally, right? Like uh, the nature of being willing to change your country while it may be very logical and sensible and, and just like a really clear slam dunk for a lot of people. It is something that a lot of people struggle to find something that they can handle doing, uh, mentally at least, even if they could physically do it. Um, so I think you'll find that while true, many, many expats that are old people are quite flexible as well. Uh, or older people, right? He's, he did say old people. I read it. Not, not, not my own commentary. Um, uh, so, so I think you'll find um, that, that it is actually kind of a naturally flexible group of people in many cases. And those that are able to be flexible, the more flexible you can be, the more benefit you're going to get from the process. Um, the more that you want to recreate your old life, whether it's bringing DVDs with you or specific food that you want to eat or whatever, uh, the more expensive, the more difficult, the fewer benefits you're going to find from the new one. Um, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't bring some things. It doesn't mean that your thought processes are wrong. It doesn't mean that I'm completely off base and you should bring everything with you. Maybe you should. Maybe there's a situation here where it's different than I'm imagining and everything makes sense to bring. Fine. But it doesn't change the fact that basically by willing once you've arrived even if you bring all that stuff with you the more you're able to adapt or want to adapt or willing to adapt to your new place the more that that new place wherever that is is going to benefit you because your old life is geared on what was beneficial to you in that old world and in, in the u.s and whatever you were doing all those little things what you enjoy doing may change how you enjoy spending your time may change how it is best to sleep may change how you uh, what you like to eat may change based on what fresh local ingredients are what is cheap and affordable what's 
healthy, and so forth. And of course, your, your weather is going to change. Even if it, you're not going for the hottest places, it's still going to be, right? Most of Latin America has far more stable temperatures than the United States. The US tends to have very strong summers and winters and, and time in between, and much of Latin America does not. Um, some does, but a lot does not. So uh, a lot of things are going to change, and the more that you're able to uh, adapt and take advantage of those things, anyone moving into a new country, uh, the more it's going to benefit you, right? Just naturally. Um, he says, Nicaragua may not be the place for me. However, that does not exclude every other place in the world. Right, absolutely. Uh, I'm not some pioneer venturing out with my horses and covered wagon. <laughs> Uh, no, no, I think, I, you know, I think Yosef for the most part is in, um, and this is mostly for everyone else, I think there's things he needs to consider, and, and he is, and he's researching, and um, I think there's, you know, some things that I'm being really a stickler on that I think there's certain physical objects that all of us have tried to bring, and all of us have regretted, and there's so much improvement to be made that there, there really is a spot where it's like, oh, I, th I think we can make his life a lot better in ways that he's really not anticipating, right? Or, or it feels like um, you're going to, uh, so, like, this has to be the exception, this has to be, and that we all feel that way, and you get here, it's like, oh, oh no, there is this pattern that we all fall into, and then we all, you know, would have, it's like, oh, I just, I couldn't picture what it's like moving until I did. We're all like this, right? This isn't Yosef. Yosef's just in this place along the path that we all travel down. And, uh, you know, as best as we can, we want to help people get past the stumbling blocks and, and find the best situation when they get there. And one of the reasons and that I've said over and over again that I think it's really important, I've got a mosquito here, uh, that, that Yosef considered more flexibility is because he hasn't been to a lot of these countries. He, he doesn't have the time uh, to go, or he doesn't feel he has the time to go and put in a lot of time moving around from place to place. I'm not saying he should. It's just a thing that a lot of people do that provides a lot of important benefits. And, and he's trying to, uh, possibly for very good reasons, work around that. He's trying to make a, a really good, well-educated decision to get to the right place nearly so right away, right? Maybe uh, he goes to Placencia and realizes he wants to be an orange walk in Belize or whatever, and he needs to make minor tweaks. What he doesn't want to have to do is make major tweaks if he can help it. So he's trying to avoid those things. That makes sense. But I also think that preparing your life for the ability to make major changes, should you need to, is going to benefit you very potentially. The chances that he's going to find the right place on the first attempt is a little bit unlikely. Possible, but a little bit unlikely. And um, there's going to be a lot of learning about the places he goes and about himself and about his relationship with those places and his relationship with his things. All that's very likely to change in ways we may not be able to predict. I may be wrong about how it's all going to interact with him, but I'm very likely right that it's all going to become in flux and he's going to find himself a new person in many ways. And the more flexible you are, just the more you're in a, in a place where you can take advantage of whatever that means for you. All right, guys, thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe if you get the chance. Get down there and uh, leave comments, uh, questions, feedback, whatever. Send in videos or ask your own questions. Uh, all that in the show notes, information on how to send that, that stuff in, like Brent did, uh, is all in there to make your life easy. Thanks to Yosef for the continuing conversation. This is really good stuff, and I think people benefit from seeing uh, and hearing this discussion as it happens to, to kind of go through your thought process and, and my thought process on different stages of this, this path. But importantly, being incredibly similar in certain ways uh, as to what exact things we had, thought process that we went through. I was standing at exactly the spot you are, or nearly so, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and uh, completely appreciate what you're feeling and what you're experiencing there. Um, I, I certainly uh, feel like it's a similar path and similar shoes uh, being worn. And uh, for everyone, if you'd like to help support the channel, we're going to put a link up above. You can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. That comes directly to me. It's like Patreon. Helps pay for the cameras and everything that we do here. And we also have a membership, which you can join. It's just $5 a month. It's just a commitment to help support the show. And we do have a private group for discussing that. If you are Don, who's been trying to get into that, send me a direct email from the show notes because I can't get a hold of you to get you into the group. Otherwise, I know you're trying to get into it. And uh, for everyone else, like and subscribe. Watch another video after this one. It really does help the show. And I will see all of you tomorrow.